Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the latest in our series of webinars uh, from the Ayn Rand Institute on Ayn Rand's Fort Hall Forum Talks. Uh, sorry, we're starting a little bit late. We had a few technical difficulties. My name is Ben Bayer. I am a fellow at the Ayn Rand Institute. And with me today is my fellow fellow at the Ayn Rand Institute, uh, Aaron Smith. Hi, everyone. Hi, Aaron. Uh, so just want to remind people that uh, what we are doing with these uh, sessions is we're, we're trying to draw attention to the recent uh, series of lectures that were just posted to ARI campus featuring the whole series of talks that Iron gave at Boston's Ford Hall Forum every year. Uh, really fascinating both as uh, philosophical documents but also as kind of cultural artifacts for their time and we're trying to look at them to see what kind of enduring relevance they have uh, for our, our, our day today. Uh, and we're not going to go over everything that she talks about, but we are trying to draw attention, highlight a few interesting aspects of these talks that you might have missed the first time, or if you haven't uh, taken a look yet, I uh, might encourage you to take a look for the first time. Ben mentioned that the webinars are focused on Ayn Rand's Fort Hall Forum talks. Uh, and she gave a bunch of them starting in 19, I think it was 61. Uh, she was there every year <clears throat> for quite a number of years. Uh, and given the, the time she's giving these talks, uh, so this is the early to mid to late 60s, moving into the early 70s, early and mid, I think, 70s. Um, she's writing about the culture is in a particular state. Um, there are many different cultural trends that she's talking about. It's uh, the environment, the kind of burgeoning uh, environmental movement. It's the hippie culture. It's uh, civil rights activism, um, the Vietnam War. There's a, it's a whole lot of cultural trends that she's talking about. Uh, and one of the things uh, that keeps coming up in these talks uh, is that that philosophy is what drives cultural movements. So one of Rand's, um, one of the things that's really distinctive about Ayn Rand is that when she's looking at events in the culture, trends in the culture, things going on, she's reading news reports and so on uh, about the Apollo 11 launch or the Woodstock Music Festival. She, ha she, wa she looks at these events and interprets them from a philosophical perspective. And she thinks the causes of these trends and the way uh, is always philosophical in the end. Uh, and that and the one of the things she's doing as a commentator is trying to talk about the meaning of these events, the roots, the causes, um, and explaining what really is at stake uh, philosophically. So today we're discussing a talk that she gave called Global Balkanization. Uh, and in that talk, she, she zeroes in on, on irrationalism I'll say something about that. Uh, irrationalism and collectivism as leading to this phenomena that she calls tribalism. And there's a discussion, a lot of discussions about tribalism today. Um, and in the, let's see, two webinars ago, uh, Ankar and I gave, uh, gave a webinar on the anti-industrial revolution talk that Ayn Rand gave and also her talk, Apollo and Dionysus. Uh, and likewise, in looking at the, the Woodstock Music Festival side by side with the Apollo 11 launch, you know, the moon launch, um, and looking at those things, she's also focusing on what are the philosophical, what is the philosophical meaning of these events, what's underlying it. And she talks again about irrationalism and a sort of a split between reason and emotionalism. Uh, so it's from that perspective that I think it's really helpful to listen or re-listen to some of these talks uh, I think it helps to learn what to look for when you watch events uh, in terms of like watching what Ayn Rand looks for. It's like what to look for and how to understand these things in terms of deeper philosophical issues. Yeah, it's interesting, Aaron. Uh, she's not just at the beginning of this essay, she's not just talking about what is the cause of a cultural movement or phenomenon. She's, she's raising the stakes a little bit more. I mean, at the beginning of the essay, she says, have you ever wondered about the process of the collapse of a civilization, not the cause of the collapse, but the process? And yeah. so she, she's suggesting here that this tribalism phenomenon, which we're gonna say a little bit more about what that is shortly, is 
is one of the manifestations of this process that is being caused by the, the philosophical movements uh, and ideas that you just mentioned. Uh, and why is that? Why would it be that something that most people regard as kind of idle academic banter would be responsible in her view <clears throat> for, the, for the gradual collapse of a civilization? And I think the answer to that question has a lot to do with one of the other continuities between uh, this talk and some of the other ones that we've been discussing, uh, because she's suggesting that these philosophic ideas uh, are, she doesn't just talk about the content of the ideas or about what it means to practice them, but also about what it is that motivates them and what motivates people to want to practice them. Uh, uh, literally. And very early in, in this talk, you see her uh, discussing what she takes to be, uh, what she thinks this tribalist trend reveals about dominant political ideology of the day. Uh, she's, she's talking about how, you know, so for over half a century, modern liberals have been observing the fact that their ideas are achieving the opposite of their professed goals. Uh, and she talks about the blood-drenched dictatorship of Soviet Russia and various other forms of collectivism and, and socialism that uh, liberals, as she calls them, are ha were beholden to in this period of the 20th century. And she goes on to say their professed goals are not the motives uh, of, this, of these ideas. Uh, and she thinks there's a kind of intellectual cover-up going on that, that, as evidenced by the fact that it's not just the world is becoming tribalistic, but that these intellectuals are getting behind it. And they're the ones who always said that they were opponents of racism, but here they are praising what she regards at least as a form of racism, uh, tribalism, under the guise of this concept of ethnicity. And and she thinks that this, this shows that, you know, they weren't really interested in uh, how does she put it, uh, liberation, prosperity, brotherhood, and peace, because uh, tribalism is at odds with all of these alleged goals. And even though they see that their goals are not being achieved, still they, they dig their heels in and uh, advocate it. Um, and, you know, so we've seen the same kind of uh, analysis in the previous few uh, talks that we've discussed when we talked about the uh, environmentalist movement in anti-industrial revolution there she says you know they profess that their goals are you know clean air and clean water for the sake of humanity but she suggests really their motive is destruction of science technology and industry and then uh, earlier this week when we talked about of living death there you know the professed goal of religion is getting men to heaven uh, and right with God but she suggests that the real goal um, especially since she thinks there is no God is is causing men to cower uh, and lose their self-esteem and uh, bow their heads on earth. And so there's this, there's a real continuity here in both her analysis of the content of these philosophies and what it means in practice, but also why it is that people are motivated to practice them. And if, if the reason they're motivated is not as noble as uh, people profess, then it's you know no big surprise uh, that they should lead to destruction and in, in, in this case even be seeming to hasten, at least in her view, the, the collapse of civilization. Now, you know, one of the things we stressed was uh, in the last one was that it is quite a claim to say that these ideas that you know, most people regard as having some kind of noble intent uh, really have some kind of vicious motivation. And so you've got to you know, consider what evidence she's presenting for this claim, does it does it bear out? And you know, there was, she, there was a certain kind of evidence she presented in this talk. We've had more evidence since she gave the talk that we can assess. Uh, we can judge her claim against. We're going to talk today a little bit about you know what the state of tribalism in the world today looks like, and does this uh, support or detract from the claim that she's making? But um, to do that, we we need to <clears throat> get clear on what this tribalism concept uh, even is. And Aaron, I think you wanted to say a few things about that. Yeah, I mean, so uh, in just following some of the things going on in the news now, there's, there are lots of discussions about tribalism, political tribalism, it, and tribes not just meaning ethnic tribes necessarily, but uh, 
but there is a phenomenon that people are trying to, they're, they're labeling as tribalism. And there's a phenomena, or a, yeah, there, there are phenomena that Ayn Rand labels as tribalism. So um, it's important to get at what exactly is that? I mean, what counts as a tribal phenomenon? What counts as tribalism? Um, and I think Rand's fullest discussion of this point uh, comes in uh, her book, I'm oh, sorry, it's my marked up, beat up copy, uh, uh, Philosophy Who Needs It. And there are two essays in there. One is called uh, The Missing Link, and one is called uh, was it Selfishness Without a Self. And in both of those uh, articles, she discusses, I think they're difficult articles. Uh, they're short, but I think they're dense. Uh, and, and the point there she makes is that there's something um, at the root of what she will call tribalism. That's a certain kind of mentality. It's a certain kind of shrinking of the range of things a mind will deal with. And she calls it the anti-conceptual mentality. So I would say, we'll talk a bit about some of the manifestations of that way of thinking or non-thinking. Uh, but for a fuller discussion, take a look at those two articles, The Missing Link and Selfishness Without a Self. Um, but if you think about the kinds of things that are labeled as tribalism in the essay uh, or the talk, uh, Global Balkanization, you get separatist movements uh, in Europe and outside of Europe, uh, some of them fueled by long-standing ethnic divisions, uh, some of them focused, and this is related to the ethnic uh, divisions, but on language, uh, you know, Qu uh, Quebec uh, trying to secede from Canada because of the language issue. And of course, the language issue is one aspect of it, but that the, has become the hot point. Um, and of course, it's called global balkanization. And so a lot of the, the discussion about what kinds of things are going on in Europe at the time uh, is a reference to the Balkan states, uh, which have been in a long-standing perpetual state of ethnic conflict, um, covered up and blanketed over for a while by the Soviet Union uh, as dominance uh, in, in, in the region. And then, you know, they put them in a Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia. And then, of course, once you took away that blanket, everything just broke back into uh, ethnic strife. So she um, didn't know about that yet, but... No, she didn't, but it, that's the kind it's, of... It's pathetic of, that... It's, you know, she says it's right yeah. to happen again, and then it, and then in the nineties it does. Yeah, uh, and so what underlies these kinds? And so I guess what what bothers her is she's looking at this stuff in the culture and saying, why is modern Europe, you know, in Western civilization, seeming to be breaking up? I mean, so when she talks about the, um, she says at the book at the beginning of the book that, or sorry, at the beginning of the essay that she's not talking here primarily about the causes of the collapse of a civilization, but the process. And the process is one of disintegration. Um, so our view is that the, the West is disintegrating. And you can watch this in advance. This is, happens decades and decades in advance of any kind of collapse. So to the things to look for is where, um, where is the culture disintegrating? Why is it disintegrating? And into what? Um, uh, and that's a lot of this phenomena. That, so when she looks out at the culture and sees uh, the divisions going on in Europe. I mean, the, the ones mentioned, I mean, they got the Basques uh, trying to separate from, Sp from Spain, uh, the, the, the divisions in Belgium. I mean, she lists a whole bunch of concretes there. Um, but she says, what we're observing is a disintegration. And they're, and they're disintegrating not on ideological or intellectual grounds. It's not that they have a different philosophy or a different set of moral principles, they're, they're dividing on things like language, that we speak different languages. Um, they're dividing on, uh, well, we have our traditions uh, and our kinds of games and our kinds of dress and our kinds of rituals and we need to be separate because we, are, we have our folk ways, so to speak. And these are the kinds of issues uh, which are dividing Western civilization, whereas it used to be, I mean, you take America, for example, you think of it as a melting pot. 
people come from all over the place from anywhere and they're different, but they could all get along together. They're not trying to break up into different groups. I mean, you had those, you have like ethnic neighborhoods and saying uh, at the start until people can really begin to sort of integrate and see themselves as Americans, as united by, you know, we're here to pursue opportunity and to be free. And that's a more intellectual association as opposed to these more um, unchosen kinds of things. Yeah. So how, how would you package then uh, you, your understanding of the concept of tribalism in light of those differences? It's a form of mental, I think it's a form of intellectual passivity um, that leads people to find their identity and the group which, with which they associate on non-intellectual criteria. So, you know, Ben and I look like each other and we, uh, we, we wear the same types of clothes and we give it, that's it. It's these kinds of things that are not, we're united by values, by things that are important to us, whether he, you know, he's from Bangladesh or, or, or he's from uh, the Midwest. Uh, it's, the, it's, it's, an, it's, it's an association and a finding of an identity and a loyalty to uh, a group that's, that's not, the criteria isn't chosen values, it's intellectual issues, it's moral principles, it's, it's things that are automatic and unchosen, like the way we look and our background and where we came, grew up. It's kind of like, if you think about it, uh, the, the, the attitude that people have sometimes uh, uh, towards the sports team they root for, except that it's not just a game to them, right? So like with, with sports, you, you pick somebody because they, they're nearby, and uh, you identify them by their uniform and their mascot, these kind of low level perceptual level things. And you know, your friends are all rooting for it and it's fun. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's because it's just a game. But uh, tribalists are people who use standards that are not much more intellectual than the ones you use to choose a sports team, uh, sometimes less. <laughs> and it's not just a game to them, it's, it's real. They, they're, they get into real political fights about these kinds of things and sometimes go to war with each other over them. Uh, and occasionally the realm of sports and tribalism even overlaps and you have wars in Central America that start over soccer matches and things like that. But that's fortunate exception. Um, but yeah, I think, I think you're right that the, uh, that it's a, it's a kind of collectivism, but it's this, this, this very intellectually primitive kind, you know, motivated by these low level, uh, anti-intellectual considerations, usually unchosen ones, uh, including ethnicity, which is which is a concept that she analyzes in, in some detail in this essay, which we're going to talk more about. Um, but I just wanted to highlight, flag for everybody that this, I, th I think it's really interesting, the contrast she draws here uh, between the old left and the new left with respect to tribalism. Uh, and and she talks about how the new the new tribalism is is kind of intellectually clean or sorry that Marxism looks intellectually clean compared to this new tribalism because it's in, it's intellectual it's an intellectual construct people are imagining themselves as part of a you know international workers collective or whatever that you know is unites people across boundaries and races and sexes and classes and it takes a real conceptual level of understanding to even envision such a collective and such a group to be a member of. And if she, of course, disagrees with it for lots of reasons, but it, it's, it's, it's better in her view than, than this kind of disintegration, you know, as opposed to internationalist, this kind of nationalist and subnationalist disintegration along these kinds of ethnic lines. And, uh, you know, when, when Ayn Rand says that uh, this makes Marxism look clean, <laughs> and you know what her view of Marxism is, uh, this, this should tell you something about what she regards uh, as the thing she's comparing it to. Um, and, th and think of the feat of abstraction that you need to achieve if you see yourself, some worker in Bangladesh, and a worker in Bulgaria, and a worker at a factory in Cleveland, as you're, that's my group. That like, we're all, 
you know, call it part of the proletariat, the, the, you know, and so on. It's that we form a group and that we are associated. That's a huge level of abstraction. Uh, and she says, this is part of the idea about it being an anti-conceptual sort of view is what generates tribal. The idea that you could see yourself as belonging to that, like that's your, that's your family, that's your group. Uh, that's, a, that's a huge abstraction. Yeah, it is. <laughs> they, 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 they don't, so she puts it as, um, <clears throat> The anti, for the anti-conceptual mentality, they be, they learn how to speak and you get some certain kind of lower level abstractions and so you can function. I mean, you're not like an animal or something. Um, but at some point they think, well, I've got enough. And they sort of ride passively on just the, the stuff that they observe around them. Uh, whatever, whatever life is like in your village or your small town or something like that, that's your world, that's your universe. And it's not that your your universe is bound by that. You can leave. But her view is the range of your thought doesn't extend beyond your village. So it's people are the people like the people in my village. My career options are the kinds of options I see around me in, you know, maybe on my TV screen um, if I can project. But it's, you know, there's the there's the mall and there's the Rubbermaid plant and there's the, you know, the cafe and there's, this is what people do. And I look around, and these are my options. It's that kind of small town mentality, but it's a small town psychological. Uh... And it's the difference between workers of the world unite and white male Norwegian Lutheran Minnesotan DFL voting farmer workers of, the, of this little segment of Minnesota unite uh, that she's talking about. Um, there's a book that came out recently that I want to recommend to people if they want to learn more about this. Um, and I've got a copy right here by Amy Chua, Political Tribes, Group Instinct and the Fate of Nations. I've been reading it in preparation for this, this student conference that we're going to do in November on this topic. Uh, and there's a, a lot of data in here to, that's worth thinking about in light of the kinds of considerations that Rand is giving. For example, she surveys a whole series of foreign policy decisions that the United States has made over the years uh, and mistakes that we've made by not understanding the role of tribal loyalties in various conflicts. So for example, uh, United States saw the war in Vietnam as basically an ideological conflict, you know, communism versus capitalism, but, and, and surely that was an element of it, but just like Rand is observing uh, uh, the, 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 collectivists in this conflict uh, are not going after their professed goals. And she talks about how there's, an, there's a long-standing ethnic rivalry between uh, uh, native Vietnamese and uh, Chinese, uh, ethnic Chinese people who are often you know, the ones running the markets. And that that adds fuel to the fire of the, uh, the conflict over communism and the communists exploit it. And the same thing happens basically uh, that she talks about in uh, in Afghanistan. It's not just a fight between Islamists and moderates. There's a whole ethnic uh, rivalry between the Pashtuns and the Tajiks. And, and then in Venezuela, which has been in the news a lot lately, uh, where uh, Hugo Chavez and then Maduro after him um, exploited a lot of ethnic resentment between basically Indians and whites uh, living in Venezuela. Uh, you know, even though a lot of people thought that that Latin America, Latin America was relatively free of ethnic conflict. It turns out that the socialists and the collectivists knew how to exploit the lingering resentment there was uh, in order to come to power. And you know, <laughs> if if there isn't a better example of where their professed goals of peace, love, and brotherhood and prosperity aren't actually being achieved, it it would you know Venezuela would be a really a really good such example. Um, all of this, of course, is something that is on Rand's radar screen, I think, in part because, you know, she's an advocate of capitalism, an advocate of laissez-faire capitalism, and, and she makes the point that I think, you know, is, is a provocative one to people who might not have heard it before, that it's, it's not communism, but capitalism that is really the ideology of of peace, love, and brotherhood, if you want to put it that way, because it's the one that finds a universal uh, uh, bond between men in the form of trade and commerce. Uh, that you know, 
everybody's money is green. And, and uh, if, if there's a way for someone to profit by trading something with somebody across the globe, uh, you know, who happens to you know, be of a completely different ethnicity, it encourages them to do that and to form bonds. And I mean, this, I think, connects to the point that you were making before, Aaron, about um, the melting pot in America, because, uh, of course, it's a capitalist system that was uh, closest to being realized in the United States in the 19th century. And that's when uh, a lot of this melting happened for this very reason. And talk about a wave of immigrants. I mean, right. the, the, essentially what you've got is this, a, a massive wave of, of immigration into the country. Um, and But what matters in the end, uh, not always immediately, not always locally, depends on the people you're dealing with. But in the end, what matters under capitalism is that people are left free and that they rise by means of competence, intelligence, ambition, um, not pull, family, ancestry, racial connections and things like that. Uh, and that's, that still exists and you have to, uh, in, in the kind of worst elements of it, but essentially what capitalism did was it left people free to function and rise by their own virtues and not by, you know, where they came from. Yeah, I recently watched a documentary <clears throat> of the history of New York, mm. and the, uh, you'd be shocked to learn about the, the ethnic gang warfare and, cor you know, corruption in politics that happened in city government in the 19th century when people were, you know, basically just arriving in the country for the first time and hadn't been acculturated. But, you know, you, you do not today see this kind of strife between Irish and Italians uh, in the way that you did back then. And it's because of, you know, they've, they've had a hundred years of trading with each other uh, to help ameliorate that. I think and, maybe we should go to one of the, the chat questions. But let me, let me say one thing before we yeah. go there, just re briefly on that point, is it's an achievement to see people <clears throat> that are very different, they talk different, they sound different, their backgrounds are different, they eat food differently, there's all of these, to see them as, um, to have a unity or a sort of brotherhood, so to speak, with that, I mean, in the, but because it's a brotherhood of values, you have to be able to see yourself as um, joined by a shared, um, by, by shared values, shared goals, shared boundaries, you know, in a way, to, in terms of like individual rights and things like that, that you don't view people as a threat. You view them as potential values, um, you know, except where the view of a potential threat is earned, but it's, um, it's a real achievement. It's not the default setting. Uh, it's, it's an achievement. And it also helps, I think, to think <clears throat> about how you, this sort of melting pot may be much more likely uh, and this connects to you know, some political debates that are happening today, because much more likely in a nation of immigrants where the people who uh, have melted together are precisely the opposite of the sort of people you were talking about before who can't see past the scope of their village, right? They've had the foresight to think about what would it mean to travel to the other side of the globe in a completely different place? And could I interact with people and offer values in such a place? So there's a, there's a, there's a mentality that you have to have to want to make a choice like that. Yeah. It's gonna make you the sort of person who's more likely to be able to adopt a common culture with people from across ethnic uh, grounds. Yeah, so. and, and likewise, the, the kind of mentality who wants to remain in a very traditional culture where there are very defined roles, there are defined, yeah, everything's defined, you know? Uh, and that, that's the function in which, that's the, that's the context in which they want to operate. Because to rise out of that, you have to think independently for yourself. Wait, why are we doing it this way? Why are we having arranged marriages? Is that good? As opposed to, what do you mean? That's the way it's done. It's, my grandfather did it. My grandpappy did it. It's like, this is what, and the, 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 the individuals who don't just conform to the way things are, uh, as if that's some sort of metaphysical absolute, uh, are the ones that get out. And the ones that stay, I mean, there's a reason why some of these places remain as traditional. <laughs> yeah. So I want to I want to eventually talk more about what tribalism looks like today, but maybe now is a good time to look at this first question from Harry about uh, art forms. Mm, yeah. Because I think that helps. That'll help uh, clarify what, just exactly what Ayn Rand is saying about ethnicity and what she 
what she means by and what she uh, uh, what she doesn't mean by it. So, I mean, you know, I think Harry is referring here to this line. What's the question? Uh, you read it. Uh, so she he says I'm he's troubled about her what looks like her dismissal of primitive art forms. Mm. Um, she, she makes the kind of derisive comment about ethnic females with swishing skirts. And if you've seen one kind of folk dance, you've, you've seen them all. Uh, and uh, I take it that she, in saying something like that, she's, she's echoing, uh, you know, some of the kinds of points that you were referring to earlier about the attitude of somebody who, well, this is the way that I've always uh, known how to dance and I don't want to try out anything new. Um, but is she saying, do you think, Aaron, uh, that, you know, therefore anybody who likes to watch hula dancing, which is what Harry's referring to here, uh, is uh, somehow uh, irrational or something like yeah, that? Yeah, no, I don't think so. I think, so there are a number of things to say about this. One is, um, Rand has a negative, so, okay, let me just address the first one, was, uh, her point is this, it's not that, like, she doesn't like primitive art, and I don't either, but that's a, <laughs> but so when you say dismissing, she dismisses it. Well, what do you mean dismiss? She dismisses it as a relevant or significant reason to secede from a country to go to war with a neighboring group who doesn't swish their skirts in the same way. That's what the issue is. So the issue is um, a lot of these, like, tribal and ethnic conflicts and stuff arise on the basis of they have different traditions than us. They talk different than us. Uh, and they're not from the same clan or from the same ancestry. And Rand regards those as insignificant in the context of, of what, thinking about what unites people and what values should bring people together or pull them apart. And she says, it shouldn't be on the basis of things like this. Um, and you know she, her view is that all primitive art is essentially similar. It doesn't mean it's exactly the same. It's essentially similar. Um, and the 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 point about the um, she said something like, if you've seen uh, you know one group of people jumping up and down and clapping your hands, <laughs> you've seen them all. And I think that response is very much um, like I'm not sure, but is it like a sense of life response? I mean, that she looks at that as like this is. Yeah, it's not, so it's not dismissing the primitive art or getting rid of it. You can have a museum about it. You can go to it. I suppose you can like it. Um, I don't find much of value there. I mean, this is an individual, unless you're talking about this as archaeological. Well, but I think he's talking about more than that. I mean, I think Harry's wondering, can't you, can't you have some kind of aesthetic appreciation uh, for, for forms of primitive art, even if, even if you don't, even if you agree that they're, they're not the, the greatest art ever and i would say you can and and i think there's a lot of interesting examples from history to think about in this regard i mean if you think for example about the great uh 19th century european composers chopin and liszt and people like that. i mean they were all three quarters of their music is is uh, looking at old polish or hungarian you know folk melodies uh but then transforming it into something uh, grander and you know more conceptual uh and uh so it's not that there's nothing to be appreciated there somebody comes up with a clever melody and you want to turn it into a symphony uh the, all the better um it doesn't really matter where it came from um it, the the point is you know why 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 rest with that why why stop yourself from innovating and going beyond that which is exactly what the the great composers did in many cases. Um, and those are not the only examples, there's many others, Dvorak and Brahms and Mendelssohn. Yeah, but, it, but, the, but that, I mean, exactly, that goes to the point is that if you take a, take a mazurka, you know, as like a kind of a folk dance that has a particular kind of ryth rhythm, uh, you know, the, the, the downbeat on the third, you know, note, um, and you take that as a traditional dance that you simply repeat generation after generation after generation after generation versus what Chopin does with it. Uh, it's, it it's, it's that kind of traditionalist repetition. We do it this way because it's always been done that way. I learned the folk ways of my parents. It's not that there's no value to it. It's, there's no value to the traditionalist approach 
there's no value to the pass passive approach of just passive repetition. Uh, and I think that's a lot of what this, it's intellectually passive. It doesn't mean there's no value to, or you can't appreciate it or something, but I don't think there's anything to appreciate about passivity and just mindless repetition because it's the way it's been done. And I think it's a lot and of I, it. I would also add that there's, I don't think there's anything, and I don't think she would say there's anything wrong with tradition per se. The, the idea of, of something that you do on a regular basis to kind of orient yourself. I mean, for example, she had the tradition of every New Year's, uh, you know, working on some writing because it was symbolic of, uh, you know, what she wanted to be, do to be doing for the rest of her life. And this was an old Russian folk tradition. Uh, and so the, the issue isn't that it's, it's <laughs> always bad to have traditions or even that it's bad to have traditions that are passed down uh, from your ancestors. It's th that if you're only uh, relying on these and not doing anything new, uh, not creating any new values of your own, that's... Or that's even if you don't create anything new, what you appreciated about it is because it's something that you personally independently yeah. value. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, even if you don't add anything, it's like, I happen to like mazurkas or whatever, then you have reasons behind your views or whatever the traditional dance or whatever the issue. I myself prefer the polonaises, but... <laughs> Uh, maybe we should talk a little bit more about uh, tribalism today, and that, that connects to Harry's other question, which is a good one, um, because, I mean, there's a whole raft of new evidence for us to consider uh, uh, her thesis against in light of the even further, you know, ethnic fragmentation that's occurred around the world geopolitically since 1975 uh, uh, or six, when she gave this essay. Uh, this this lecture uh, and a lot to talk about in domestic politics too um so i mean she talks about scotland uh, uh separatists scottish separatists and i mean they almost they almost voted to secede from the uk just a couple of years ago and it probably will happen again now that the british are trying to do brexit leaving the eu and and, and now the scottish want to uh want no part in that as well um elsewhere you know we have civil wars that are uh, divided along ethnic lines all over the world, Syria, Yemen, Libya, Myanmar, if you followed the issue with the Rohingyas. Um, and yeah, in, the, in, in, in our country today, there's versions of this on both the left and the right, different kinds of racial and gender uh, tribalism. And Harry asked a question about cultural appropriation. And I think that's a really good example to discuss here, the, the, the rhetoric about cultural appropriation, because... Uh, I mean, it used to be, if you remember, like in the 90s, if you were a, if you were a progressive uh, hip kid, what you would do is you'd, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd dread out your hair and you'd wear some, you know, maybe a, a Rasta hat. And uh, th that was your way of, uh, you know, signaling solidarity with, you know, progressive causes, man. Uh, but nowadays, uh, that is, that is supposed to be taboo if, if you're, if you're on the left and you're accused of cultural appropriation because white people, uh, if you're white, you're not, uh, these, these are not parts of your tribe. These are cultural artifacts that belong to somebody else's tribe. And, and there's some kind of active aggression uh, involved in adopting that. Uh, and that's, that also connects to the whole uh, rhetoric about microaggressions, um, you know, which, which are closely related. Um, <laughs> The, the issue of cultural appropriation, I think, is a really ugly, ugly phenomenon. Um, part of what unites people is that they find other things in other cultures interesting and, and valuable. Um, like, I like Vietnamese food, and uh, we, have a, we have little Saigon up here, in a little bit, little bit north of where we are in California here. And I like to go there and go shopping and it's just, there's all sorts of things that are interesting in other cultures, whether it's a form of dress or it's a form of uh, dance. Um, you know, uh, I know someone who takes belly dance classes and things like that because they, they, I like, they like the music, they like the art form. They just find it fascinating. And the idea that, no, you've taken our, you've taken our artifacts. Those are, those are my tribes. They belong to me. And that you hurt me when you adopt them in some way. It, but that's what an independent mind does. It doesn't say, this is what I grew up with, damn it. 
and they're mine. They're my tribes. It's no, you, you look around the world and you think there's a lot of interesting stuff, the ideas, art, music, uh, food. This it's a, That's part of what makes uh, life interesting for an independent evaluer, an independent thinker. And to see value in those things, that's one of the things that actually unites, not breaks apart. And this issue, it's, it's more forced disintegration. Uh, don't see value or adopt it or show it um, from my people. It's like, you know, uh, in ancient times, they used to go, when you'd, when you'd conquer, uh, conquer a village, you'd take its gods, you know, their little idols and things. Uh, you'd take their gods. So you've, and now you've got power over them. It's like, you've, it, it's like uh, you wear some kind of ethnic shirt or, or you take classes in some ethnic dance and now it's suddenly you, you've stolen our gods in effect. And it's, it's magical thinking, isn't it? That, that <laughs> shows how it's a kind of magical thinking. Um, the other really interesting example to discuss in this connection on the left is the whole notion of intersectionality, uh, which is something I've only learned more about recently, but this is the idea that you can't understand the various forms of uh, oppression that are uh, alleged to be a concern uh, without understanding kind of the, uh, the most concrete uh, combination of traits that you could have that could make you subject to oppression. So for, ex for example, this became an issue with the women's march after Trump's election, where uh, the feminist movement, of course, was, was uh, organizing this march and there was a lot of infighting because uh, the, the concern was that that white women for too long had been kind of the leadership of the feminist movement and white women don't adequately represent the concerns of uh, uh, you know black women and Asian women Latina women Muslim women who all face different forms of oppression and I mean I think it's probably true that they, they face different forms uh, but the kind of fracturing of the movement that seemed to have happened because of this, where they were then fighting over who would get the mic and who would get to be the leader and, and you know, whether various forms of solidarity should be expressed. Uh, it really underscored, I think, the increasing tribalistic nature of, uh, of the left. Uh, and um, that's not the only example, there's others we could discuss, but I don't wanna dwell too much on the left because uh, it is certainly not as if the right goes unscathed uh, in this regard these days. And this is what I find uh, particularly uh, disturbing uh, because conservatives and libertarians and others loosely called the right wing um, have at least, they, well, I mean, they've prided themselves in not uh, descending to this level. They've, they've, they've alleged at least to have a real ideological bearing in their take on politics, whether it's a whether it's a, the ideology of uh, classical liberalism and the Enlightenment or religion. But either way, it's at least ideological. Uh, but now, what we see happening is uh, a real, I think, takeover of the of the conservative movement, certainly the Republican Party, by this kind of uh, nationalistic, sometimes white identity politics sort of movement, uh, and it's definitely manifested in, in uh, the increasing uh, calls uh, for protectionism and anti-immigration uh, restrictions. And I mean, I've written some about this already uh, for new ideals. Some people might have seen my piece on the, the uh, tribalism about the North Korean uh, diplomacy. Uh, we've got more in the works on that, but uh, it's people are increasingly take understanding politics like it's just a sports game and you, you pick a team they've got the same uniforms as you and you're going to root for them come what may uh regardless of what the ideological uh issue is uh and uh that's i think yeah in that regard disturbing. though i think part of it is they're not choosing uh, they're, they're not choosing between ideologies yeah because yeah. there aren't any ideologies in that regard, I mean, it's the the political parties aren't dividing on any kind of clear ideology. Like they don't have an ideology in the sense where they have like you had Marxism, you had you had actually a philosophy. Uh, you know um, that there was a whole viewpoint about 
uh, the relationship of the individual to the state about the economics and about uh, the role of the government. And th there was a, it was a, you really could adopt or, or, or you see yourself as, as um, being associated with them and, and being on their side, so to speak, because you agree with a set of intellectual principles. And I think that's harder and harder to find today in politics. So what do you surround yourself with? Or like what do you, but what criteria do you use to decide, you know, what group to go for? And I think it's becoming increasingly anti-intellectual. Um, and then you have to decide on other grounds. So uh, we got a question from Facebook from Alan uh, asking for a comment on uh, basically the question of whether there's racism in the Trump administration. And I don't, I, I'm sort of tempted to punt this question, but I don't want to do it uh, entirely. Uh, I'll say this. I mean, I, I don't, it's, it's quite an accusation to say somebody's a racist. So you've got to have good evidence. Uh, and I don't think I have the evidence to say that I know that in his soul, uh, Trump or the people who work for him are racists. Uh, maybe some of them are, maybe some of them aren't. The, the evidence is inconclusive. But I think one thing that's, that's clear is that at the very least, there is more evidence that it's an issue that they don't care about that it's an issue that they don't care that if they have racist followers. And more than that, they seem to know that they do and exploit this fact. They may not, I mean, Trump may not be a racist himself, but he and his, you know, the architects of his campaign uh, seem to have been more than happy to exploit the kind of rhetoric that they knew uh, would get however many racists there are on the right behind them. And I mean, this is completely in keeping with the, the same kinds of themes that Ayn Rand is, is sounding in this essay on global balkanization about how the intellectual leaders of socialist movements, for example, uh, know that they can uh, exploit ethnic uh, and tribal identities to gain power and to, to get a, a, you know, uh, a foot in the door of power and, and uh, to hand out uh, uh, subsidies to their pressure groups. And it's the exact same thing, except using a slightly different kind of ethnic identity. And I think there's, I think there's a lot of evidence for that. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's long been known concern. that these kinds of divisions can be exploited or brought out for political purposes. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why um, uh, she thinks that not just irrationalism is at the cause of tribalism, but collectivism. Uh, and that, uh, and and particularly, she mentions a mixed economy. Uh, the idea that uh, governments have handouts and favors and power, and 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 power, and in that case, what you have to do is you have to get divided into pressure groups and fight for your share of the pie, as she puts it. I mean, disparagingly, she puts it that way, but it's that's the way it's thought. We're fighting over a, a, a static pie. And an individual is not really going to get much of any crumbs at all if he doesn't join a group and start fighting for favors and it fractures people into groups. Um, and she says, you've got everybody fighting for a piece of something. It's the, the women's libs, the gay, the gay libs, the Jesus freaks, you know, and all of these groups that she's mentioning. Uh, they're just, everybody's fighting for their, their piece. And, their, and, and it's not just uh, economic. I mean, in part it is, it, but it's their own bit of power and, and uh, authority. Uh, and there's a lot of, and to, so she puts a heavy burden. It's not just the irrationalism in the culture, though it's related to the collectivism. But she said a lot of it's just this the increasing growth of statism in the culture and moving from individualism uh, to, to collectivism, where you actually start viewing individuals as members of groups rather than as individuals. I think that there's a tendency uh, for some people to, to you know, wonder, is this a sort of false equivalence? You're saying that tribalism on the, the, the right uh, is as bad as the tribalism on the left, uh, when the left has been fueled by decades of 
uh, if not more, of, of, of postmodernism and Marxism that's in, in all the forms of collectivism that are encouraging this? And it's a fair question. But at the same time, when you look at our culture and you look at the level of understanding, the, the extent to which people are philosophical, which is not very, uh, and you think about the kinds of arguments that, that people have been giving for decades on the right, uh, for the positions that they've been taking, even if you agree with their positions, there's been no philosophic understanding there. And so it's, it's, it's not at all surprising that they should, you know, fall prey to the exact same kind of tribalism that you see on the left. I mean, when you see people at Tea Party rallies carrying signs saying, government, keep your hand off my Medicaid, uh, that's, if that's the level of understanding that they were approaching their opposition to Obama with, is it is it any wonder that 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 they also want their seat at the trough and they they're just fighting for their own, you know, champion to uh, to you know shovel more of it in their direction? Yeah, and in that way, it, that kind of it incentivizes people to divide into groups. Uh, and you know, when, when a nation is in crisis, typically what they do is they rally around their shared values. They rally around the core values that unite them and bring them together. And what are those, like nowadays? The shared ideals, like with, with all our differences, what are the shared ideals that we can all rally around and say, look, I know, like I, I don't have a problem talking with liberals. I don't have a problem talking with, with uh, people who are religious. I mean, I'm an atheist. I don't have a problem talking with them. Uh, it doesn't mean you agree with them, but it, if the idea is um, as long as we can talk about things and take ideas seriously and debate these things rationally and you're not trying to force your ideas on me, there's a certain sense in which we're, we're part of a reasonable sort of community where we can talk about things and reason is our standard, not force and so on. But, you know, what are the shared values? And I think it would be hard to come up with something that Americans generally would think of as these are our shared values as Americans. It's what unites us and brings us together and makes us want to be here. Um, so Aaron, I think we're coming up on an hour <laughs> and uh, I, I still want to save some time for some general questions, but maybe we should say just one word or two more about uh, what she says about the concept of ethnicity mm -hmm, and sure. maybe a little bit about what's distinctive in her approach to this. Um, you had asked, I thought, a good question about uh, something you saw in the Chua book, where you know she was assuming that. Uh, we have yeah, no, so I'll so I'll say I'll add I'll say something about that. But so um, I haven't read the book. I start I started reading. I guess it was the introduction of the preface or whatever, just to get a sense of like what the book is about, where is she going, what's her perspective. Um, and I noticed she mentioned things like right at the outset that. Um, well, we all have a tribal instinct. We want to belong to tribes. And, and I was like, okay, first of all, that's suspect right away. But then as I start to, to look at what she calls tribes, um, it was, or maybe she said groups, as I want to be fair to her, I, exactly, I don't remember what the wording was. But the idea was, you know, I, I belong to a club and uh, I see myself, I mean, you just take me, this is just an example. Um, uh, well, I won't use myself as a example, but it's we join clubs, um, we see ourselves as belonging to certain kinds of groups or associations, and there was a real mix. Like, if you think of yourself as a foodie, for example, where there's there's some kind of you could you could think of that as an in group and an out group, right? Where some people just aren't and not interested or whatever. Um, or you think of yourself as an objectivist. Well, okay, that's kind of like a group, right? Is it is it a tribe? And so it's a what? Can, so there's all sorts of ways in which human beings can see themselves as associated with other people in various contexts and for various reasons and motives and so on. But you and you can't. And I'm not saying she does. I haven't proceeded farther enough in it. But you can't see every group belonging or membership or uh, uh, as tribal. There's a particular thing that Rand regards as tribal. It's the unthought routine non-intellectual, unchosen association, uh, you know, the, I mean, the, like I belong to, um, yeah, you're bound by the same concretes, you know, uh, but it's, it's the unchosen kind. It's not intellectual. I'm an objectivist because I have certain ideas of it, 
uh, that I think are, I, mean, I think Ayn Rand's right about her philosophy and I agree with it. And so that's, I'm an objectivist. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and the, 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 of course, the biggest example of tribal identity she discusses is ethnic identity. And so there's a lot of interesting things she has to say about this concept of ethnicity. She, you know, by looking at uh, various dictionary definitions and the way that it's used, her sense is what people mean by it is some kind of combination of racism and, tra and inherited traditions, which we've talked about. So it's not just any old tradition, it's, it's tradition that you inherit as a member of a biological group. Uh, and she translates that into racism plus uh, conformity or racism plus staleness, where the operative issue there is that these are these are uh, practices or beliefs or languages or what have you that that are on, that you've not yourself chosen. You've just passively accepted them. And she suggests that grouping those two combinations, those two traits together, the uh, the biological with uh, the tradition, makes this concept of the ethnicity an anti-concept. And this is one of the things about her approach to this issue that I think makes it really distinctive because she's bringing to bear her, her work and thought as an epistemologist here uh, and her theory of concepts that, and she's able to uh, answer the, the question of, is every group just a tribe? I think by reference to this, that uh, no, there's a big difference between uh, somebody who joins a group on the basis, as you were saying, of you know, some kind of intellectual shared values and somebody who joins a group on the basis of this ethnicity concept uh, where uh, they think there's some interesting connection between their biology and their inherited traditions. And her point is uh, they're not connected. They don't deserve to be grouped together under the same concept. It's grouping uh, these issues together by non-essentials, culture, cult uh, cultural practices and so forth are not something that's a product of biology. They're, they're products of choices. And if they're unchanging, it's because people have made passive choices uh, and, and they shouldn't. Um, and so it ends up defaulting then to choices based on immediately perceivable characteristics of people who are around you that you just then passively copy. Uh, and I think that helps answer the question of, is every group a tribe? Because no, there's a big difference between somebody who passively copies a set of practices because they're what's immediately around them and somebody who thinks about these practices and evaluates them and, and makes some value choices for themselves. Um, this is an issue that actually came up recently and there was a debate between um, Sam Harris and Ezra Klein. Sam Harris, as you know, is a, is a a member of the so-called intellectual dark web, and, and uh, many of them have been critical of the rise in tribalism uh, in American politics. And Ezra Klein, Ezra Klein, who runs Vox magazine, is a uh, kind of mainstream uh, liberal progressive type. Uh, and he was accusing Harris and his cohorts uh, anti-tribalist rhetoric of a kind of inauthenticity by saying, well, you, Sam Harris, you're just a member of a tribe too. You're a, you're a member of the anti-tribalist tribe. And you and your, you and your buddies who, you know, many of whom happen to be uh, white and educated and cosmopolitan, uh, you're, just, you're just getting together with people that look like you. Uh, and it's true that, that, that uh, a lot of these people fall into that uh, description. But I mean, it, 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 it may be an accident uh, and the, the big question is, you know, well, why are they part of this member? Why did they start thinking that there was a problem with, with tribalism? Uh, is it because there was a, there was a parade going by a, a bunch of tribalists, a, a bunch of anti-tribalists who looked cool. And so they, they went along with it or was it because they, they surveyed the intellectual and cultural landscape and, and noticed some problems with it and, and thought that things could be a lot better than this. And there's concerns with this. Uh, that yeah, it's a choice then, that they made. Uh, and then Klein's trying, choice, yeah, and tr Klein's trying to get uh, Sam Harris to, to acknowledge in some way, uh, to, to admit in some way that he's a member of a tribe. Uh, and I think, because his idea, I mean, the idea that he's pushing is um, there's no such thing as objectivity. 
In other words, so if you you always have to see yourself and be aware of this is you're always looking at things from a tribal perspective. Uh, and whether you admit it or not, there's some sense in which you're belonging or see yourself as part of a group and you're looking at things from that perspective. Now, one aspect of this is true is you can't get out of your ideas. You can't get out of your philosophy. So you, you have ideas that are implicit or explicit and you do view things from a certain perspective. I view things from a certain perspective. But it's about, are you self-consciously aware of what that perspective is and willing to change it if you think that it's false? or that you think there's evidence against it. Like, uh, but the whole idea that there's, there's, a, there's a world out there that exists on its own and that we have a tool, reason, to know it, that's what's been disintegrated by modern philosophy. And then that, that's Rand's perspective is that the, yeah. the primary thing is the destruction of objectivity uh, and, and, a, and a massive loss of confidence uh, in the ability of reason to achieve knowledge and to guide our affairs. And this is what in, in most of these Ford Hall Forum talks, what you get is modern philosophy has abandoned objectivity and abandoned reason. Uh, and the rest is a footnote to that. The increasing collectivism, the increasing, you know, young people not knowing what to do with their lives or how to choose values or that you even choose them, you know, and looking for groups to belong to, somebody to tell them what to value, what to do, how to live, somebody to protect them. I don't know. Just, it, associate but reason isn't their means of association it's not their tool of guidance and it's undercutting that yeah and one of the things i think that that makes rand's approach on this so distinctive is 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 i mean it's precisely the issue that you're raising that indeed it does presuppose to to be able to say that not everybody is a tribalist does presuppose that so, that everybody is capable of objectivity and everybody's capable of making it a more intellectually active choice. Now, a lot of people don't make that choice. They could, but they don't. And uh, those who do make it uh, are capable of being objective. Uh, and that doesn't mean that they're going to make the right decision. It doesn't mean they're guaranteed to get the truth. Uh, but it's the only way to get it. And this is very importantly connected to the issue of free will, that, that, that Rand is an advocate of uh, the idea that we have a volitional consciousness, the ability to turn our minds on or off. Uh, and the, the tribalist mentality is, is, is one whereby an individual keeps their consciousness at a fairly low level, even though they could if they wanted to raise it up. And I think it's interesting that, that Sam Harris, for example, has such a hard time answering this question from Ezra Klein it's no big surprise to me because Sam Harris is a determinist who doesn't think we have free will. And, and that's a major uh, intellectual weapon that he is lacking uh, in this exchange, which if and he were Pinker. to- And Pinker. His enormous appreciation for enlightenment values, reason and things like that, when you, you kind of cheer when you read stuff like that. But then he's also missing a major piece of the issue, the whole issue. And it's not just, there's one more weapon, but it's like, he's missing a central issue. Uh, and, and you wrote an article about this, uh, about Pinker and this issue about free will, but it's- Yeah, uh, and especially yeah. when you think of uh, tribalism as a form of racism, as, as a particularly crude form of racism, uh, it's, it's worth remembering the essay that Ayn Rand wrote on this topic, which is just called racism. It's in the virtue of selfishness. And there you know, she identifies racism as a form of deterministic collectivism. It's the idea that your ideas and your culture, et cetera, your character are determined by your biology. And as long as, as, long as you maintain some kind of determinism, that is gonna be harder to rule out. Now, somebody like Pinker you know, claims to be uh, against certain kinds of determinism, but not others. Uh, he maintains more of a genetic biological determinism, which makes it even harder, I think, for him, even though he definitely wants to repudiate racism, it makes it a little harder for him to do. Yeah. And when you, and when you look, and when you, so when you have Ayn Rand looking at some things going on in Europe, some things going on in the United States, pointing out these phenomena as tribal, and then saying that they're ultimately caused by philosophical issues. I mean, this is what it looks like. And, and you'll see this over and over again in these Ford Hall Forum talks. It's, if you tell people that you don't have control over your life and your choices, you know, that who you are and the life you lead is, is fixed by your biology, 
obviously issues of uh, things like race and stuff will play a much larger role. If you tell people that um, that reason is incapable of getting knowledge, that you got to get it from somewhere else, you go to, a, I mean, your only options are you go for your feelings or somebody else's say so. I mean, those are the only options once you've tossed away your tool of survival or your tool and of usually thought. Both. Which, and usually both. Which, which person say so do you feel the best about because it's the yeah. most familiar yeah, right. yeah. The one exactly. you exactly. and it's therefore right. the one that you didn't choose. Yeah. And yeah. I think in the end, it's faith, reliance on authority, and feelings boil down to emotions. Who do I feel I want to accept? What am I comfortable with? And it's that can't be your guide. But if you're relying, if you're going on your gut on emotions and other people say so, um, and you don't think of yourself as free, uh, and you're a part of a group, and you should think of yourself as part of a group. I mean, this is the way that these kinds of ideas get into the culture and drive these sorts of uh, disintegration. So I think uh, we should take a few quick last uh, general questions, final general questions, and then and then try to wrap things up. Sure. Um, there's a there's a question on the table about. From Paul. from Paul on Facebook, is any ideology which does not treat reality as the ultimate standard properly defined as a form of tribalism? Before I answer that, let me just say, if there's anybody who wants to ask a last question, uh, now is your chance, because I think if we don't get any more, we will, we will finish after Paul's in the interests of uh, time. Yeah, I, I would say no to that. Uh, I, would, I would take that as subjectivism. Um, because if you think that reality is not your ultimate, I mean, you have to cash that out, what it means to say that reality is your ultimate standard. Uh, it's not that reality simply imprints itself on you and you know what's true. I mean, you have to use reason, you have to figure out how to use your tool <laughs> to come to an objective knowledge of, of reality. Um, but to reject reality as the standard, if we take it as the facts, to reject that as your standard, the only thing you have to go on is your your feelings, and ultimately, I think that boils down to some form of subjectivism. Uh, so I wouldn't put that as tribalism, though. I I agree. I mean, somebody like Immanuel Kant, who thinks that we can only know the phenomenal world and not the noumenal world, uh, is somebody who is not treating reality as the ultimate standard, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I don't think Kant was a tribalist, uh, but he's the first hippie. He, did, he didn't really have any friends, actually. But uh, at the same time, um, I think what if there's a lesson to take away from this lecture, it's that uh, these highly abstract intellectual philosophies that discourage or negate the efficacy of reason, even if it's possible to accept them without being a tribalist, uh, it's, it's hard to avoid the consequence that people influenced by these philosophies down the road are going to become tribalistic because, I mean, they're for the reasons that you discussed. If you undercut reason and you don't think you yourself can make choices about what's valuable in life uh, because of these philosophies, you're going to default uh, to this lower level, perceptual level, anti-conceptual level of consciousness, and that's going to encourage you to just glom together with whatever other people are doing in your neighborhood. And that's, yeah, and that's she, I don't think, and I don't think she thinks that a real tribalist sort of anti-conceptual mentality would ever be a Kantian. <laughs> it's like way too abstract. It's a whole philosophical perspective and theory that would be beyond them. But yeah, the idea is that the influence is undermine reason and objectivity, and people will look for alternatives which are groups yeah, and, and feelings. It That's, gets even more specific than that too, because I mean, if you take a look, for example, at the various forms of uh, uh, Frankfurt School Marxism, for instance, which are heirs to Kant's philosophy in many ways, instead of saying you perceive the world through the lens of the categories and the, uh, the forms of sensibility, uh, the, the Frankfurt Marxists who have had a lot of influence on postmodernism say, no, you, you perceive the world through the lens of your economic class, your, uh, your sex, your race, your gender, uh, and you can't get outside of that perspective. And that's why you're trapped with your tribe. And it's why yeah. you can't find common ground uh, and common humanity with other people. Yeah. And again, that's a, it's another form of fracturing. It's another form of dividing people into groups that can't communicate with each other. 
Uh, it's that everybody has their own perspective and which they're trapped in and they can't really communicate with other people. And I can't ever know your experience because you have your own perspective and it's another way of dividing people. Uh, and that relates to, we, so we got a question here from Sam Cox, the word bal balkanization. Can you explain that in a few words, why Balkan? Well, it refers to uh, nations in the Balkan Peninsula, which have been fractured and torn apart by uh, ethnic strife for a long time. And that's the idea was that it, thinking about Europe as balkanizing, it's like becoming like the Balkans. I mean, they're, they're dividing on, you know, in terms of like some form of tribal loyalties and, and yeah. things like that. And Rand talks about how you know, World War I began in the Balkans when the uh, Archduke of Serbia was assassinated by a Bosnian terrorist. Uh, and that's what led to the, to the Great War. Uh, Yugoslavia was was then formed out of these smaller little principalities after the war, held together for a while by the Tito and the communists. But then just like the Soviet Union, which also tried to cobble together lots of different ethnic republics, fell apart uh, after the end of the Cold War. And that's why we had the, the, the civil war in the Balkans in the 90s, which I remember happening. And there was actually a piece in the Washington Post just the other day about how uh, so these tensions haven't gone away, and there are people in the Trump administration who are interested in encouraging various forms of irredentism, uh, where the, very, the Serbians still want chunks of Bosnia and chunks of Kosovo, and the Albanians still want chunks of Kosovo, and the Macedonians still want chunks of Greece. And uh, this is all below the surface, and there's been you know a couple of decades of peace there, but uh, I don't think they've addressed the underlying issues. So keep our fingers crossed about what happens in that part of the world. I think we should draw a line here, Aaron. We're, we're yeah. about an hour, 15 minutes um, after having started a little late. So um, thanks, everyone, and uh, stay tuned. We're, we're going to look at the uh, poll results. And again, if you haven't had a chance, uh, please find the poll, the link to the Doodle poll that we put in the chat in both Zoom and Facebook. Uh, try to answer that survey question. It's just going to give you an option to t say which times of day would be best for these seminars to happen. We'll take a look at that data. Uh, and we, you know, we may change the schedule in the future on the basis of it, but at least for the time being, uh, until we announce a change, because um, these are sort of experimental, uh, for the time being, at least unless we announce a change, the next one will happen on Monday. Uh, and the topic will be the uh, our cultural value deprivation uh, last lecture, which happened a little bit before this one in the '60s, and that will the discussion that will be led by you, Aaron, and yep. uh, Dr. Ankar Gatte. Great. Well, thanks for attending. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye.